guys. I brought a guest. Um, good afternoon. Uh, first off at the top, uh, I want to acknowledge that there's been an additional wave of threats uh, to Jewish community centers uh, and anti-defamation league offices. According to some reports, there have been over 100 bomb threats phoned into Jewish institutions since the start of this year alone. As the President said at the beginning of his joint address, quote, we're a country that stands united in condemning hate and evil in all of its forms. We denounce these latest anti-Semitic and hateful threats in the strongest terms. It is incredibly saddening that I have to continue to share these disturbing reports with you. And I share the President's thoughts that he fervently hopes that we don't continue to have to share these reports uh, with you. But as long as they will, as long as they do continue, we'll continue to condemn them and look at ways in which we can uh, stop them. Uh, now on to news of the day. Uh, you saw President Trump yesterday continue to deliver on two of his most significant campaign promises, protecting the country against radical Islamic terrorism and repealing and op replacing Obamacare with a patient-centric alternative. We talked a lot about the executive order protecting uh, the nation from foreign terrorists entering the United States yesterday. Uh, and so on to Obamacare, I'd like to introduce uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Dr. Tom Price, to come up and talk to you a little bit about the plan to repeal and replace Obamacare. Dr. Price. Thanks, Sean. Good afternoon. First, let me uh, just uh, share with you what an honor it is to serve as the Secretary of Health and Human Services. I'm the third physician out of 23 individuals who've had the privilege of serving as the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And the mission at our department is to improve the health and safety and well-being of the American people. And we take that mission uh, very, very seriously. Uh, and for many Americans right now, uh, their ability to gain health care or health coverage is a real challenge. Uh, for most Americans, they receive their health coverage through their employer. It's about 175 million folks. Those individuals will see no significant change other than there won't be a penalty uh, for, for uh, not purchasing coverage. Uh, for the folks in the Medicare system, there will be no changes at all in the current, uh, in the current law. But we're talking about those people in the individual and small group market, the, the, the moms and pops, the folks who run the corner grocery store, the corner uh, cleaners. Those individuals out there are having huge challenges gaining care and gaining coverage. And then Medicaid is a program that by and large has decreased the ability for folks to gain access to care and we want to make certain that we address that. This is about patients. This is not about money. This is not about uh, something else. This is about patients. Uh, and sadly, the costs are going up for those folks in the individual and small group market. The access is going down, and it's only getting worse. You know the stories. Premiums increased 25% over the last year on average. Arizona had an increase of 116%. Deductibles are going up for many, many folks. If you're a mom or a dad out there and you make forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, your deductible in this market, in that individual and small group market, oftentimes is eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 a year. What that means is that you've got an insurance card, but you don't get care because you can't afford the deductible. And we know that this is happening by talking to the folks who are out there trying to provide the care. A third of the counties in the United States, one third of the counties in the United States have only one insurer offering coverage on the exchange. Five states only have one insurer offering coverage on the exchange. One insurer is not a choice. So we need to make certain that we correct that. In Tennessee this morning, it was announced that there are a number of counties that have no insurer offering coverage on the exchange. Insurers are leaving the market on the exchange. Last year there were 232 insurers that were providing coverage, uh, uh, that were offering coverage on the, on the exchange. Now there are 167. That's a loss of about 30 percent in one year alone. And all of this means that patients are not getting the care that they need. Now the principles that we have as our, as our guiding star uh, are affordability. We want a system that's affordable for everybody. Accessibility, we need a system that's accessible for everybody, a system that's of the highest quality, a system that incentivizes innovation in the healthcare system, and a system that empowers patients through both transparency and accountability. The President spoke last week, last Tuesday, to a joint session of Congress, and he laid out his, his principles. Uh, first, wanted to make certain that those with pre-existing illness and injury uh, were not priced out of the market. Nobody ought to lose their coverage because they get a bad diagnosis. In terms of affordability, health savings accounts, gro growing choices for, for patients is incredibly important. Uh, tax credits, 
uh, that allow individuals to be able to purchase the kind of coverage that they want, not that the government forces them to buy. We've always talked about uh, uh, in, in terms of what kinds of reforms need to be put in place that we need to equalize the tax treatment for the purchase of coverage. Those, again, in the, in, in the employer-sponsored market, they get a tax benefit for buying health coverage. Those folks that are out there in the individual and small group market, no tax benefit. And that's what this plan would do. State flexibility. It's incredibly important that we allow the states to be the ones that are defining what health coverage is, have the flexibility, especially in the Medicaid program, to be able to respond to their vulnerable population. Uh, lawsuit abuse, the President mentioned, and it's incredibly important. The practice of defensive medicine wastes billions and billions of dollars every single year, and we need to make certain that we're addressing that as well. The uh, President also talked about a, a glide path, an appropriate transition to this new uh, new, uh, new phase uh, for health care for our country, and that's important as well so that nobody falls through the cracks. Uh, buying across state lines, uh, buying insurance across state lines, the President talked about this uh, on the campaign over and over. American people understand the common sense nature of purchasing across state lines, and it increases competition, and we need to make certain that that happens, and then addressing uh, the incredible increase in drug prices. Um, there are three phases of this plan. One is the bill that was introduced uh, uh, last evening uh, in the House of Representatives. That's the, the start of all of this. Second are the, all the regulatory modifications and changes that can be put into place. As you all well know, the previous administration used regulations to a fairly well. In fact, there were 192 specific rules that were put out as they relate to Obamacare, over 5,000 letters of guidance uh, uh, and the like. And we are going to go through every single one of those and make certain that they, if they help patients, then we need to continue them. If they harm patients or, or increase costs, uh, then obviously they need to be addressed. Uh, and then there's other legislation that will need to be addressed that can't be done through the reconciliation process. So the goal of all of this is patient-centered health care, where patients and families and doctors are making medical decisions and not the federal government. Uh, we, look, we commend the House for the introduction of the bill yesterday, and we look forward to working uh, with all individuals in this process. And I look forward to a few questions. Yes, sir. You're familiar from your time in the House with the clout that conservative groups like the uh, Club for Growth and Heritage Action have with rank and file members. What does it say about this legislation uh, that these groups are already uh, out with opposition to, to it? Well, I think that, it, that this is the beginning of the process, uh, and, and we look forward to working with them and, and others to make certain that, again, we come up with that process that aligns with the principles uh, that we've defined, uh, that they actually uh, uh, adhere to or agree uh, with as well, and that is that we need a system that's affordable for folks, a system that is, that's accessible for individuals, that's of the highest quality, that incentivizes innovation, uh, and that empowers patients. Uh, and so we look forward to working with them through this process. Secretary, there's a Congressman Chaffetz said today that Americans will have to forego a new iPhone to pay for health care, and they'll have to kind of make these choices. Uh, does the administration agree with that? Will Americans, under this plan, will they need to maybe sacrifice other goods to pay for their health care? This is an important question, because what's happening right now is that the American people are having to sacrifice in order to purchase coverage. And as I mentioned, many individuals can't afford the, the, the kind of coverage that they have right now. So they've got that insurance card, but they don't have care. Uh, what, what our desire is, is, is to drive down the health care costs for everybody. Uh, and the way that you do that is to increase choices for folks, increase competition, uh, return the regulation of health care where it ought to be, which is at the state level, not at, at the federal level. Uh, all of these things that, that uh, are taken in their aggregate uh, will, in fact, decrease the cost of health, uh, health care and health coverage, uh, and that will allow folks to be able to purchase the coverage that they want. Yes, sir? I have uh, two questions for you. The first has to do with uh, guarantees that you can make as the administration's point person on this legislation. Can you guarantee that whatever legislation emerges and makes it to the president's desk uh, will allow individuals, if they like their doctor, they can keep their doctor? And the second guarantee is, can you also guarantee that health care premiums for individuals will come down with this new legislation? Again, a remarkably important question because, as you'll recall, the promise from the last administration was if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. Both of those promises turned out to be not true. Uh, we think it's incredibly important for the American people to be able to select the physician and the place where they're treated uh, in th themselves, that, that the government ought not be involved in, in that process. Uh, and so our goal is to absolutely to make certain that individuals have the opportunity to select their physician. In terms of, uh, of premiums, uh, we, we believe strongly that 
through this whole process and as it takes effect, uh, that we'll see a decrease in not only the, the, the premiums that individuals will see, uh, but a decrease in the cost of health care for folks. Remember, that, this, that was another promise that the, that the previous administration made, that, that you'd see a decrease in $2,500 on average uh, for families across this land. In fact, what they've seen is an increase of $2,500 or $3,000. So we're going to go in the other direction. We're going to go in a direction that empowers patients and holds down costs. Mr. Yes. Mr. Secretary, uh, you, you are quite a distance away uh, from conservatives with this plan and the central part of it, which is tax credits, which they see as yet another entitlement, very similar to the entitlement of Obamacare. They're different in form. Yeah, how do you convince them, since it's going to take tax credits to make this work, that they need to swallow this and, and move forward with the bill? I mean, you're getting yeah. an awful lot of opposition on this central tenet of this whole thing. Yeah, this is all about patients. Uh, and in order to provide that transition and in order to make it so that nobody falls through the cracks, we've got to have a system that allows for individuals to gain the kind of coverage that, that they want. And we, conservatives and, and, and uh, others, have said for a long, long time that we believe it's important to equalize the tax treatment for those purchasing coverage, gaining coverage through their employer, and those not. And the tax credit is the opportunity to be able to equalize that tax treatment. Uh, folks have talked about this for, for, uh, for many, uh, many years, actually, so that there's not a distortion in the tax code for who's able to gain a, a, a benefit for being able to purchase coverage and not. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, um, you were talking about making sure people don't fall through the cracks. The last administration with Obamacare focused in on making sure the underserved uh, were part of the equation. What is the safety net or the safe part that you have to make sure to ensure people don't fall through the cracks beyond the tax incentives, but also for the underserved, who are now part of, many are now part of the program that weren't before or prior to Yeah, this is, this is uh, extremely important as well, and it's, and, and the, the current system, as you likely know, uh, for those vulnerable in our population, especially in the Medicaid population, this is a system that's, that's broken. You've got a third of the physicians in this country, one third of the doctors in this country that would be eligible to see Medicaid patients who aren't seeing Medicaid patients right now. And it's not because they've forgotten how to take care of patients. It's because of the rules that are in place that make it too onerous or too difficult for them to see Medicaid patients. So we believe that it's important to allow states to have that flexibility to fashion the program for their vulnerable population that actually responds to that population in a way that gives them the authority, them the choices, them the opportunity to gain coverage and the care that they believe most appropriate. Out that that is not happening when you give it to the states. Is there some type of punishment or some type of uh, piece that you're going to put in place to make sure that that happens, that they follow through on your intent? Yeah, there's uh, absolutely. There's accountability throughout the, uh, uh, the, the plan that we have that would uh, allow for the Secretary and the Department to be certain that the individuals that we believe uh, need to be cared for are being cared for in, at, in the state at the appropriate, uh, at the appropriate level. Uh, but we believe this is a partnership. This is about patience and partnership. The previous administration tended to make it about government. We believe it's about patience and partnership, and we want to partner with every single person in this land who wants to make certain that we allow the kind of choices and quality to exist. Yes, ma'am. The, um, the President tweeted earlier today, he described this bill as our wonderful new health care bill. There's been a little bit of confusion. Does this represent the administration's bill, and is there anything in this bill that the administration cannot support? This has been a, a work in progress. As you know, this has been going on for over, over a year. Uh, the work that, uh, that I had the privilege of, uh, of uh, participating in when I served in the House of Representatives in the last Congress uh, was, was open and, and transparent, and uh, we, we, we invited folks in uh, to, uh, to give their ideas. and. Uh, Tens, if not hundreds, of people had input into that process. This grew out of that, and over the past number of weeks, we've been having conversations with uh, with folks uh, on the Hill, uh, in the House, and in the Senate, uh, and other stakeholders. And so, this is a work product that is a, a result of all of that all of that process. The president and, and and the administration support this step in the right what we believe is in in the right direction, uh, a step that repeals uh, Obamacare and gets us moving in the direction of those principles that I outlined. Do you support everything? Yes. Yeah. That's bill that's sitting on the table, sir. Do you support everything that's in the bill sitting on the table, sir? Well, this is a work in progress, and we work, we'll work with the House uh, and the Senate in this process. As you know, it's a legislative process that occurs. I'm glad you pointed out the, 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 the bills on the table there. As, you, as you'll see, this bill right here was the bill that was, was introduced um, in, in 2009 and 10 by the previous administration. 
Notice how thick that is. Some of you will recall that I actually turned the pages and went through that piece of legislation in a YouTube. The bill on the, the, the pile on the right uh, uh, is, is the current bill. Uh, and what it, what it means is that we're, we are uh, making certain that the process, that the decisions that are going to be made are not going to be made by the federal government. They're going to be made by patients and families and doctors. Mr. One Secretary, last. given the opposition that John and others have brought up here today, uh, does this plan already need to be salvaged in your view, and how do you do it? Oh, no. Wait, this, you know what, what happens with these things. You start, uh, you start at a starting point. People engage and they get involved in the process, uh, uh, sometimes to a greater degree. Nothing focuses the mind like a bill that's uh, currently on the table and, and that has, uh, has, a, has a work in progress uh, or in process. And, and uh, we'll, we'll work through it. This, 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 is, this, is, this is an important process to be had. The American people have said to their elected leaders that the, the, the Obamacare process for them gaining coverage and care is not working. That's what they've said. And so we believe it's important to respond to the American people and provide a health care system that allows for them to purchase the kind of coverage and care that they desire. Yeah. Uh, you said in your letter to the House Chairman uh, that necessary technical and appropriate changes might need to be made for this bill to reach the President's desk. So what specific changes is the White House and the administration looking for in this bill? Well, as I mentioned, there are three different phases to this process. One is this bill, this legislation that's working through under the rules of reconciliation, which is a fancy term to mean that, it, that it, uh, there are only certain things that you can do from a budgetary standpoint has to affect either spending or, or, or revenue. Uh, there are things that you can't do in this bill, and those we plan on doing in, in, uh, in, in, across the horizon in phase two, which is the regulatory portion, and then in phase three, which is another piece of legislation that, that uh, would be going through the House and the Senate uh, uh, by, with, a, with a majority, supermajority uh, in the Senate. That process will, will incorporate all of the kinds of things that we believe are absolutely necessary to reconstitute that individual and small group market and to get us in a position, again, where patients and families and docs are making in these decisions. Secretary, Secretary, bearing in mind that the CBO score is yet yet, can you guarantee that this plan will not have a markedly negative impact on the deficit or result in millions of Americans losing health insurance? Uh, what, what I can say is that the goal and the desire I know of the individuals on the, on the Hill is to make certain that this does not increase the cost to the federal government. Secretary, two, yeah. elements, two elements of the bill. Uh, I have questions about how they control costs and how they help with access the Medicaid uh, per capita block grant to the states. Uh, how is that sort of fundamentally different uh, from the Obamacare regime on Medicaid in terms of expanding access? And then the second point, why doesn't this bill uh, uh, do away with the cost sharing community ratings uh, uh, regime that Obamacare has? Uh, to the per capita cap, the Medicaid again is a, is a system that doesn't work for patients. You got, you got folks out there who need care, who need to see particular physicians, who aren't able to see them. The, the, all Americans should be uh, uh, saddened by the situation that, that, that we have when, you, when there are patients out there that can't get the care that they need. We believe one of the keys to, to providing appropriate care in the Medicaid population is, is uh, allowing the states to have the flexibility to address that Medicaid population. Remember, Medicaid population is four, di four different v demographic groups. It's those who are disabled, it's those who are seniors, it's healthy moms and kids by and large. Those are the four main demographic groups. And, and we, the federal government, force states mostly to take care of those individuals in exactly the same way. If, if you describe that to the folks back home on Main Street, they say that doesn't make any sense at all. You need a program that's different for the, for the healthy moms and kids to respond to their needs that's different than, the, than folks who are disabled and, and, and seniors. And so what we believe is appropriate is to say to the states, you know your population best. You know best how to care for your vulnerable, vulnerable population. We're going to watch you and make certain that you do so, but you know how to do that. And that will decrease costs markedly in, 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 in the Medicaid program. We're wasting significant amounts of money. Not that folks are getting too much care. We're wasting it because it's inefficient and there's significant uh, um, uh, abuse in the system. So uh, in terms of, of, of the cost sharing, I think that the cost sharing measures are, are being addressed. It's important that we, that we run through that process. This is the, uh, uh, the process where we felt the previous administration was spending money uh, that they didn't have the authority to spend, and Congress is working through that to make certain that the rightful 
uh, holders of uh, the authority to spend money in this nation, which is the is the Congress of the United States, uh, exercises that authority. Mr. Secretary, yeah. how does the White House and you feel about the label Trump Care? Oh, I'll let others uh, pro provide a description for it. I prefer to call it patient care. This is about this is about patients at the end of the day. This isn't about politicians. This isn't about insurance companies. This is about patients. And patients in this nation, the, especially those in the individual and small group market, these are the folks. I had the privilege of going to Cincinnati last week with the vice president to a, to a small business roundtable. And one of, the, one of the business owners, one of the small business owners there, said he had 18 employees last year at this time. This year he has 15 employees, not because he doesn't have the work, but because of the cost of health coverage for those individuals forced him, forced him to let three people go. Now, they're being forced to let three people go because the federal government has put in place rules and regulations that make it virtually impossible for folks in the individual and small group market to provide coverage for their employees. This is a system that's not working for people. So if, you, if, if, you, if we focus on the patients, I'll call it patient care. If you focus on the patients, we'll get to the right answer. A major complaint of conservatives with phase one of the Obamacare repeal and replace is that it is missing a measure that would uh, allow health care to be sold ac across state mm -hmm. lines. Now, the president said this morning that that would be in either phase two or phase three. Is that something that you believe the president could do through executive action and then you yourself could do? Or is that something that you believe has to be addressed legislatively? There, there, there are different a aspects to the purchase across state lines that will allow individuals to gain, again, the kind of choices that they want. Um, th some of this might be able to be done uh, from a regulatory or a rule standpoint. Um, some of it will require uh, legislation, and that's where we're, where, uh, we're going to need uh, uh, the assistance of our friends on the other side of the aisle. The American people have demanded that they be able to purchase coverage across state lines, purchase coverage that they want for themselves. So whether it's through association health plans, which allows individuals who are in small business groups, like the fellow that I just mentioned, to pool together nationally to be able to purchase coverage, or whether it's uh, 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 mom and dad uh, who, who don't gain coverage through their employer. Uh, through something called individual health pools that allows folks to pool together solely for the purpose of purchasing coverage even though they're not otherwise economically aligned. Uh, that, that allows people, 18, there are 18 million folks in that individual and small group market. That would allow those individuals to be able to purchase coverage and get the purchasing power of millions. That's, that's huge power and authority that we want to put in the hands of people, that we want to put in the hands of patients. And some of that may, in fact, require legislation. Yes, sir. Mr. Secretary, uh, thank you. Uh, two questions, but first, Congressman John Faso of New York has said that the issue of denying federal funds to Planned Parenthood should be separate <laughs> from whatever health care bill finally emerges from Congress and is signed into law by the President. Is that the administration's position as well? And my second question is this. You mentioned earlier the people who had their health care plans canceled when they thought they could keep it. I believe in your state of Georgia, more than a million people had that experience. Will some of the plans that were canceled be able to come back under the new health care plan? Yeah, in terms of, of, of uh, Planned Parenthood, we, we think it's important that the legislature work its, work its will on this process. Uh, it's incredibly important that, that we not violate anybody's conscience. Uh, we want to protect the conscience provisions that, uh, that exist. It's also important to appreciate that through community health centers, the bill that's being proposed right now would allow greater access for women to health care in greater numbers of facilities across this, this uh, land. And they've actually proposed more money for, for women's health care than, than currently exists. So I think that they're, they're working their best to, uh, to address that issue. In terms of whether or not old plans that, that were available before uh, might, might be available, um, absolutely. And we believe that, that, it, that the, the, uh, the opportunity to provide a robust uh, um, market, uh, robust choices for individuals across this land will be secured. And again, that's one of the keys to bringing down the premium costs of bringing down the cost for health coverage. So we're excited about that and look forward to that uh, uh, coming to pass. Mr. Yeah. If the new plan calls for repealing the revenue generating taxes and penalties, but keeping the entitlements, how is that sustainable? 
Uh, well, that, that's the, the work that somebody mentioned over here, the, the Congressional Budget Office score. And, and once, they, once the Congress receives that score, then they'll be working through that to make certain that, in fact, uh, it, it is fiscally responsible. Uh, imagine, if you would, however, a system where, we're, where the, the, the incentives within the system are all to drive down costs to provide greater choices and competition for folks and respond to the specific needs of, of patients. And in so doing, what you do is actually get a much more efficient system for the provision and the delivery of, of, of health care. It's a system we don't have right now because the previous administration felt that the government ought, federal government ought to do all of this. And we've seen what, what, what came about when the federal government does all of that. That is, increasing premiums, increasing deductibles, decreasing choices, you got a card that says you've got insurance and you walk in and you can't afford what it is uh, uh, that, that, uh, that's trying to, for the doctor that's trying to take care of you. So this is not a system that's working for folks in that individual and small group market and in the exchanges. Mr. Secretary, many have complained that Obamacare resulted in higher wait times in the emergency room. Will this new bill cause that? Have you have any idea on that? One of the things that, that, uh, that uh, the previous administration said was that they were going to be able to drive folks away from one of the most expensive areas for, for the provision of health care, and that is the emergency rooms. In fact, they did just the opposite. Um, and, and much of that is because of, again, the rules and the regulations that they put in place. So if, from our perspective, we, we believe that if, you, if, if individuals are able to purchase the kind of coverage that they want, then they'll have access to the kind of doctors and other providers that, that, that they desire and won't need to be able to be seen in the emergency room. They'll already have that, the, the, the care. Emergency rooms ought to be for emergencies, not for the standard care that individuals uh, tend to receive right now. So we believe that if you put in place the right system, then emergency rooms and the emergency physicians will be able to have the opportunity to care for those individuals that appropriately present to their department. Mr. Secretary, I'm interested in following up on your comment that it's important that no one uh, vote on anything that violates their conscience. Um, federal funding already can't be used for abortions, but are you saying the administration has a position on provision of birth control at these community health centers? And secondly, um, is the administration looking to actively uh, withhold <coughs> funding to Planned Parenthood if they could? continue to provide abortions, as has been reported. Yeah, we're working through all of those issues. Uh, as you know, many of those were through the rulemaking process, and, and, and we're working through that. So that's not a part of this piece of legislation uh, right here. Do have a view on provision of birth control and access to it when you're talking about women's health care, which you brought up and saying you wanted to expand more community funding? Yeah, what, what, what we're doing, as I say, is working through the rules and the regulations to see where the previous administration was, see how they did it, and whether or not it needs to be addressed, with the understanding that what we believe is important when we look at the rules and regulations is to define whether or not the rule that rule or regulation actually helps patients or uh, or, or uh, and decreases costs or harms patients and increases cost if it does the latter then we need to do away with it if it does the former then we ought to accentuate it conscience you were talking about what was the issue of conscience you were talking about then to make certain that individuals in in uh, in the market uh, are not forced to do things that violate their conscience Yes, sir. Secretary, thank you, sir. Common people and the small businesses have been waiting for this <coughs> new bill uh, under President Trump. So any message, sir, for them? Well, I, I think that, that this is the culmination of, of uh, years of work. Um, it's the culmination of years of concern and, and frustration by the American people. Uh, they knew at the time that the, that the previous bill, uh, the previous law passed that it wasn't going to help them. They knew that, that, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that costs were going to go up. In fact, we predicted uh, at the time that costs would go up and that access uh, uh, would, would go down. Uh, and so this is the culmination of years of, of, of hard work by the electorate, by the citizens of this country, uh, to say that we want a system, again, that respects patients and families and doctors in these decisions. Thank you, One more. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, the President tweeted out earlier today that he believes that he's working on a plan to uh, have drug prices come down by uh, spurring competition. Can you tell us a little bit about what that plan is going to be, when it might be rolled out as a part of these phases? And then the second question, um, the bill also includes a tax break for uh, insurance exec executives that make more than $500,000. So this is about patients. Why is that tax break important for this legislation? To the latter, I'm not, I'm not, not aware of that. I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. Drug pricing is really important. Um, so many individuals are now uh, having s significant difficulty uh, being able to afford the medications that they've been, they've been prescribed. Uh, so we, it, it, whether it's, it, and it's not able to be addressed specifically in, in, the, uh, in, in this phase one, 
because it's not a revenue or a spending issue for the federal government. Uh, so uh, uh, it, it, it can't be in this phase one. But in phase two and three, uh, which may be concurrent uh, uh, in, along with this phase one, but uh, in phase two and three, then we look forward <laughs> to bringing uh, solutions to solve the remarkable challenge that patients have across this land with the, with the uh, increasing price of, of drugs. I've got to run. You've got a guy right here who's going to answer all the rest of the questions. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Price. Um, let me just kind of continue on. Um, the, uh, the bottom line I think that the Secretary is making is that uh, Obamacare sought to cover 20 million people and in the process it drove up costs for everybody, whether or not you were in the exchange or not. Most people get their insurance through their employers. Older populations get their uh, health care through Medicare. Low income populations get their health care through Medicaid. Uh, and veterans get their insurance through TRICARE. So what we're talking about here is a very defined amount of individuals uh, that we're trying to address and not affect the entire system. Obamacare turned our health care system on its head to address the pool of individuals who don't fall into the buckets that I mentioned. The, our plan that we're talking about today with the House will ensure that those individuals who receive the care that they need if they want an affordable cost while not sending rates skyrocketing. Obamacare was an overcomplicated bill that served the special interests and not the American people. These over 974 pages that were passed and then we were told we had to read them are filled uh, with carve-outs by over $1 billion of health care related lobbying that was spent on the year that Obamacare was crafted. Our plan in far fewer pages, 123, much smaller, much bigger. Um, so far we're at um, uh, 57 for the repeal plan and 66 pages for the replacement portion. We'll undo this and remember, Half of it, 57 of those pages, are the, are the repeal part. Uh, so when you really get down to it, our plan is 66 pages long, half of what we actually even have there. Uh, we'll undo the massive disaster and replace it with a plan to return health care back to the patient. As the President outlined in his joint address, he expects five core principles to guide Congress through this health care process. First, ensure that the American people uh, with pre-existing conditions have access to coverage. Second, ensure a stable transition for Americans currently enrolled in the exchanges. Third, provide more uh, equitable tax treatment through tax credits for people who already don't receive tax advantage health care from their employer. And I know that's something that Secretary Price was talking about. For the vast number of people who get their insurance through, uh, through their employer, they're getting it tax free. Uh, they are not taxed on that, that benefit. Uh, which is something that is not afforded to people who are in the individual market who either run a small business or, or are sole proprietors. Fourth, we should expand the power of health savings accounts to return control to Americans over their health care dollar and decisions. They should be able to choose the plan they want, not the plan that's forced on them by government. And finally, we should give our state governors the resources and flexibility they need with Medicare to make sure that no one is left out. Uh, this is the o Obamacare replacement plan that everyone has been asking for, the plan that the President ran on, and the plan that will ultimately save the system. It's also a culmination of years of dedicated work and careful thought by Republicans to find a replacement that will best undo the damage that's been caused by Obamacare, while ensuring that all Americans have peace of mind during this stable transition period. These are the principles for which conservatives have been fighting for for years. President Trump looks forward to continuing the dialogue between the administration and the Hill on saving the health care system. What's important to remember is that we're not going to be able to do all of this in one bill. As the Secretary mentioned, there are two other steps as well that allow us to get more of the President's plan accomplished after we pass this first important major step. The second piece is already underway, and that's what Secretary Price can do through executive action. Uh, he has already rolled out a handful of important actions, including the major marketplace stabilization regulation to help bring stability to the collapsing insurance market. He'll continue to enact a number of policy changes in the regulatory and administration space, administrative space to achieve what the first step cannot because of the nature of reconciliation. The third piece of uh, executing the President's health care plan is on requires 60 votes uh, in legislation maybe, maybe more, depending on uh, what we can do and when. That's how we'll move forward on the policies of purchasing across state lines, lowering dr drug prices that just came up, and repealing any of Obamacare's premium spiking insurance market distortion that can't be done through this current bill. Also yesterday, uh, in addition to speaking with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, the President also had separate calls with Prime Minister of Japan, Abe, and South Korean's acting President Huang. 
Uh, during both of these calls, the President reiterated the United States' ironclad commitment to stand with Japan and South Korea in the face of the serious threat posed by North Korea. He also emphasized that the administration is taking steps to further enhance our ability to, defer, to deter and defend against North Korea's ballistic missiles using a full range of the United States' military capabilities. Uh, moving on to today's schedule, this morning the President had a call with President Kenyatta of Kenya. He'll have a readout for that call soon if it's not already out. The President and the First Lady also announced the official reopening of public tours here at the White House. Uh, you may have seen the President stop by to surprise uh, greet some of the first visitors on their tour. Uh, we're looking forward to welcoming the people back to the American people back to what is affectionately referred to as the People's House. Uh, we are the world's only executive residence and office of head of state that also serves as a museum free to the people. Uh, visiting the White House is obviously an experience that uniquely American, and we encourage guests of all ages to come visit the White House, their house. Also this morning, the Secretary of Commerce, uh, Wilbur Ross, held a press conference announcing that Chinese ZTE Corporation has agreed to a record high combined criminal and civil penalty of $1.19 billion after the company illegally shipped telecommunications equipment to Iran and North Korea in violation of sanctions. This civil penalty is the largest ever imposed by the Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security and pending approval from a federal judge, the combined penalties between the Commerce Department, the Department of Justice, and the Department of Treasury would be the largest fine in forfeiture ever levied by the U.S. government in such a case. This settlement tells the world that the days of flouting U.S. sanctions regime or violating U.S. trade laws are over. President Trump is committed to ending the disrespect of American laws and American workers. So back to the schedule for a second. Uh, this morning, the President also received his daily intelligence briefing. He had lunch with Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, who will be, continue to be an important partner as the President's uh, nominee for the Supreme Court, Judge Gorsuch, uh, begins the confirmation process in the next couple weeks. At this moment, the President's leading a discussion on immigration with Senator Cotton and Senator Perdue and members of the White House senior staff. The President and the Senators were expected to discuss the merit-based immigration reforms that the President mentioned at last week's joint address. Later this afternoon, the President will lead a meeting with the House Deputy Whip Team focused on uh, repeal and replace of Obamacare. There will be a pool spray at the top of that meeting. The gather time is 3.20. The President will also meet with Richard Trumka, the President of the AFL-CIO. Uh, they're expected to discuss the importance of investing in our country's infrastructure and re renegotiating trade agreements like NAFTA. Uh, there will also be a pool spray at the top of that meeting, and we'll have uh, further details on it. Uh, this evening, the President will visit with a group of Boy Scouts who are in Washington to participate in a near-century old tradition of sharing scouting's achievement with key government officials. Looking ahead, I want to let you know that the President will be welcoming at least two foreign leaders in the coming weeks, and I expect additional announcements uh, of additional leaders later. But first, uh, next week, Chancellor Merkel of Germany will visit the White House, and the following week, the President will welcome Prime Minister Al Abali of, uh, of Iraq. Uh, with that, I'll kick it off with your questions. Hey, Jonathan Carl. Hey, Sean. Hey, Sean, Sean uh, it's been a Jonathan. full. Thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sean, it's been a You're full. Out of practice. <laughs> no, it's been a full three days since the president said that President Obama had his wires tapped, his phones tapped at Trump Tower. In those three days, has the White House come up with any evidence whatsoever to prove that allegation? Yeah, I, I addressed this multiple times yesterday. I think the president, we put out a statement on Sunday saying that uh, we would have no further comment and we were asking the House and the Senate Intelligence Committees to look into this uh, concern um, and report back. Can't the President just ask the FBI Director? Well, I, I think, I, look, I think, has he asked them? no, the President has not. And I think that, you know, we, we've gone back and forth with you guys when the, I think there is clearly a role that Congress can play in its oversight capabilities. They made it very clear that they have the staff, the resources, and the process. I think that's the appropriate place for this to handle. Uh, I think if we were to start to get involved, you would then write stories about how we were getting involved. Uh, so it's a no-win situation. I think the smartest and most deliberative way to address the situation is ask the House and Senate intelligence committees who are already in the process of looking into this, to look into this and other leaks of classified information uh, that are troubling to our nation's national security. Um, so as the President said in the statement on Sunday, uh, we believe that that investigation, as well as the investigation of other classified leaks and other important information that threatens our national security 
be looked into by the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, uh, and then we encourage them to report back. Do you believe that President Obama ordered I, you something know, like I, this? I, I get that that's a cute question to ask. My job is to represent the President uh, and to talk about what he's doing and what he wants. And he has made very clear uh, what, his, um, what his goal is, what he would like to have happen. Um, and so I, I just I'll leave it at that. I think we've tried to play this game before. I'm not here to speak for myself. I'm here to speak for the President of the United States and our government. Sean, Zeke. Uh, Following up on uh, what Secretary Price said earlier, um, he was asked by John about uh, whether the administration was willing to make a if for, 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 Amer for the American people right now who like their doctor or like yeah. their health insurance plan, is the White House willing to make a commitment to them today that when this when this when this replacement bill is passed, if it passes, that they will on the outside on the at the end of that be able to keep their doctor and keep their health care plan? And secondly, uh, just changing gears radically onto it, China overnight issued some. Uh, some strong rhetoric and promising consequences for the deployment of the fat missile system to South Korea, if you could right. respond to that. Um, so on the first piece, um, I, I think, look, one of the things that's important to understand about this process uh, that's very different from when the Democrats did it, you recall then Speaker Pelosi said you're going to have to read the bill to know what's in it. I think there's a big difference. This is the bill. It's right here. It's on the website. Uh, we're going through regular order. If you go to the, the House of Representatives website, Speaker Paul Ryan's website, it's listed. Everybody can read it, and it's going to go through what they call regular order. We're not jamming this down anybody's throat. It's going to go through a committee process. Um, all parties involved, all representatives in the House will be able to have input into it. I think that's the way to conduct um, this, this, uh, this process, is to do it to allow people to watch the process happen in the committees allow members of Congress to have their input in it, to make amendments, uh, to see that we get the best bill that achieves the goal for the American people. When it was done the last time, it was jammed down people's throat. And look what happened. You had 974 pages that people struggled to read afterwards and figure out what had just gotten passed, and the consequences were frankly devastating. So to your point about keeping your doctor, in a lot of cases you've lost your doctor for a couple reasons. One, they may not participate in the plan. They may not take insurance at all anymore. Two, they may not take Medicaid. Or three, they may not take Medicaid. Um, and, and the list goes on and on about why they might not be there. Or your plan, the plan that you got, is no longer accessible. As the Secretary mentioned, one-third of all counties in the United States no longer take Medicaid, in, or excuse me, have only one plan that you can choose from. So it's a fact right now that you, can, in most cases, you have no choice. In many cases, you've lost that ability. Our goal is to actually add more choice and more competition. Right now, the government tells you you must have this plan or you will pay a penalty. And within this plan, here's what you have to have. We've lost the element of choice and competition in healthcare. And by bringing all of that back, I think there's a higher degree of likelihood that you're going to get the plan that you want and you're going to get the doctor you want because it'll be your choice, not the government's choice. And that's a big, big difference. This plan was jammed down everybody's throat. And the consequences took their plans away, it took their doctors away, and it drove up costs. This plan allows more competition, more people to enter it, and the American people and patients to make a decision on what plan they want. If they have a plan and a doctor they like, then they're going to choose a plan that allows them to continue with that doctor. But there's going to be more competition and more choice, not less. And that's, frankly, what you have now. Uh, with respect to China, I think I addressed this yesterday, um, we stand shoulder to shoulder with Japan and South Korea and doing what we can to protect uh, that region in particular from an attack from North Korea. We understand uh, the situation. We continue to work with them. As I mentioned, the President spoke to both, um, both leaders uh, yesterday. Uh, we provided a readout of those calls. Uh, but we obviously understand the concern of China. Uh, but this is, this is a national security issue for them. Hunter. Thank you, Sean. Um, how concerned is the President with the situation between North Korea and Malaysia right now? Well, I, I would, I, as I've said, I think we, we're very well aware of the, what's going on in the region. The President obviously had a conversation with, in particular, the leader, the acting President of South Korea last night um, and with respect to what's going on there. And, and again, I'm, I'll refer that uh, to the National Security Committee to, to give you further. Sean, Cheryl Sean, Bolden. Sean. Cheryl, Sean. I know. I, I, sorry, I forgot you yesterday. I appreciate it. Um, so two then questions. Um, one on health care. If the CBO scores this bill and it does not provide the amount of coverage that the Affordable Care Act did, will the President still support it? 
Well, I'm not going to get ahead of, I mean, like I, Secretary Price mentioned this, let's not get ahead of the CBO going through this. But I think, as I mentioned to Zeke, I mean, one of the things that's important to understand, there's this, this is, this bill has to be done in the phases that it has to, to address the repeal part of it and the replace part of it. There are only certain things that we can do through reconciliation. And then there's the regulatory piece that we can do through, through action that the Secretary is empowered to do, frankly, under Obamacare. Um, and then third is, is an additional piece of legislation that addresses things. But there are cost-saving measures um, that in competition uh, aspects of this that have to be included in, two, in phase two or three because they are not allowed in, in the reconciliation bill uh, because of the nature of how reconciliation works on Capitol Hill. So I think that one of the things that we have to understand is that how that score comes out from the Congressional Budget Office will depend on what they, whether they look at it uh, specifically with just a phase one or whether they look at it in its totality. Uh, but I'm confident that if you look at what's going on right now, Cheryl, it's unsustainable. I mean, premiums in state after state, as Dr. Price mentioned, they're up 25 percent on average. Arizona is 116 percent. I think, you know, Oklahoma's in the 50s. Minnesota's in the 40s. I mean, this is unsustainable for a family to continue to pay the premiums that they have, uh, and for individuals, small business owners, et cetera. So the question is, uh, can we allow people to go on this trajectory uh, where more and more of their paycheck is getting eaten up in a plan that's frankly not giving them choice, doctors, or plans that they want? Uh, this plan, I think, uh, clearly achieves those goals a lot better. It gets the price it cost containment down. It gets price control under, and it allows doctors and plans to re-engage in the marketplace as they were prior to this. And I think that that is a, a major aspect. Go ahead. Hold on. Wait, Cheryl waited. Thank you. From yesterday, I had a nominations question. Is there something that's preventing the White House from submitting the nominations of Sonny Purdue for Agriculture and Alex Acosta for Labor? I believe Alex Acosta was sent up to the Hill um, earlier today. Uh, we should have an announcement officially out, so sometimes there's a little bit of a lag. I apologize between my office and the, but that one's up, and I'll check on Sonny Purdue. I think some of it's just in coordination with the, with the Senate, uh, so pardon my uh, time. Yeah, Trey. Thanks, John. I, have, I have two questions for you. First, will the President offer a correction to his tweet this morning that states that 122 prisoners were released from Gitmo by the Obama administration and then returned to the battlefield? Uh, you can take that first. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously the President uh, meant in totality the number that had been released on the battlefield, uh, that have been released from Gitmo since, uh, since uh, individuals have been released. So that is, that is correct. My second question, is the White House concerned about this uh, new information that came out in WikiLeaks today that U.S. intelligence agencies are potentially purposely providing uh, vulnerabilities to uh, tech products here in the United States? I'm not going to comment on, on that. I think, uh, obviously, that's something that uh, has not been fully evaluated, and if it was, I would not uh, comment from here on that. Kevin. Uh -huh. Sorry. Yeah, Sean, I was going to ask about branding. The president uh, in the past has put his name on buildings and different products. When it comes to health care, does the White House feel that the bill being presented today should be known as Trump Care from here on out? I know it was asked to the secretary. And at what point do you think that the transition should go away from Obamacare to the new administration? Well, as soon as it's repealed, we can get rid of that. Uh, I think that will happen quickly. Um, and as Secretary Price mentioned, I think we're less concerned with labels right now uh, and more in terms of action and results. And I think that's what uh, our focus has been is getting that cost down, getting that choice back that we mentioned. Yeah. John, um, DHS is reportedly considering separating families that cross the border illegally. <laughs> How does the president feel about that? I'm going to refer, that's a DHS matter. I mean, we don't get involved in uh, either customs or, or ICE enforcement. So I think that's that's a question better reserved to uh, to both DHS and ICE specifically. Jim. Oh, thanks, John. Uh, you know, on, on, on the Obamacare question, um, one of the criticisms on this is that there is still a de facto uh, individual mandate because it allows insurance companies to increase uh, premiums up to 30 percent if people if there's a gap in coverage. Uh, and, and I have one more. But, but, but. Well, that's not. I mean, that's not a man. I mean, the difference is under the current bill that's here, if you don't buy insurance, you pay a fine. Under the current bill, you don't have. There's nothing that mandates you to buy insurance. That's up to an individual. So, it, I mean, by, by its very definition, it is not, can't be considered that. What's your second one? Okay. Well, I mean, uh, you don't think it's a de facto mandate in the sense that well, there's be. a penalty in place, as there is now. I mean, it's not by the government, but it's by the insurance companies. 
Right, but there's no there. That's I mean I think you answered your own question on that one. I have one more. I have one okay. more. I just uh, another talk. But uh, the, the president has uh, has blamed the Democrats in the Senate for blocking the cabinet. Um, last Thursday, uh, the Republicans actually called uh, called a recess early. Uh, previously uh, adjourned on Thursday early. Uh, previously, they called a recess the week before. Um, does the president uh, ha have any plans to call for the Senate to? Uh, remain in session and uh, Congress stay in session until they approve the nominees and maybe even also well, this, this, isn't, this isn't a, a Republican issue uh, I mean it's not Republicans that are playing beat the clock on, on a lot of these nominees uh, as I mean we've discussed this since the transition time I mean, there were several nominees uh, that frankly weren't even considered controversial uh, by their by the standards of, of Senate Democratic leadership uh, and yet have been held up over and over again. I don't think that that's a very different scenario than uh, going back and being with constituents, uh, which was on the Senate schedule. So I don't, I don't think that that's a synonymous thing. Gonna, do we have Michael Medved uh, ready to go on uh, for our Skype question? Michael. Yes, hello. Uh, Sean, Sean, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Uh, obviously, today there was a big emphasis on Obamacare, which is profoundly important to the American people. But it, it seems that too often in uh, the last several weeks, the administration has gotten distracted and media have gotten distracted by talk of wiretapping at Trump Tower or the president calling his predecessor a bad and sick guy or criticizing the uh, ratings of Celebrity Apprentice. Do you think the White House could do a better job of focusing on the issues that really matter, the reforms that matter to the American people, uh, rather than getting distracted? to the subsidiary conflicts as we move forward into the uh, coming months. Thanks, Michael. Uh, you know, respectfully, I would say that we have been focused. We're here talking about Obamacare and the need to drive down the cost and access for health care for every American. I think that's a pretty uh, significant uh, oh, yeah. thing to be focused on. Yesterday, we were talking about the President's effort to continue to keep the nation safe, to make sure that people aren't coming in to the country uh, who aren't here for peaceful purposes. Uh, the president's talked to almost 50 world leaders. Uh, he's had 30 plus executive actions on all sorts of stuff from regulatory th aspects to things that will create more jobs. I think that's a fairly focused effort. Um, that being said, I think, look, whether he was candidate Trump, president-elect Trump, or now President Trump, uh, the president has always made it very clear uh, that one, or not he made it clear, but I think the voters made it clear that one of the things that they appreciate about him is his ability to be authentic and to speak uh, very forcefully and very directly with the American people. Um, and that's an aspect that I think was central to why um, he was elected, is because he's not a canned politician that's going to give uh, the same state answers over and over again. Sarah. Uh, going back to Fred's <coughs> question, you know, conservatives have started to call this Obamacare light. President Trump has promised to fully repeal Obamacare, but this bill leaves a lot of the structure of Obamacare intact. If this is the policy that passes, is President Trump confident in the future he can say that he fully repealed Obamacare? Yeah, absolutely. As I mentioned, I mean, the first half of the bill that we put forward repeals it. There are three things. I mean, each phase that we've talked about, phase one, phase two, and phase three, there's a repeal and replace aspect in each one. Um, but Republicans and conservatives have been talking about uh, added competition um, and driving costs down for decades now, selling across state lines, uh, small business pooling, all of those things have been part of conservative plans for a long time. Um, and I think instilling that competition in it, allowing more access, I mean, I think there's a big difference. There is no, you know, we have for the longest time, if you're a conservative, I mean, you think about this right now, that you have anyone who has uh, a, an employer based, their job comes from an employer that gives them health care. They're getting a, a subsidy. They're getting a credit. They don't pay taxes on their health care, and their employer doesn't either. That's a huge disadvantage to anyone who's a sole proprietor or owns a small business. And so, frankly, to allow the playing field to be leveled um, and allow small businesses, which are frankly the job creators in this country, to allow entrepreneurs and self-starters to get the same tax treatment that a Fortune 500 company gets you is a very conservative principle. Um, and again, I, I think, look, one of the things that's important, Sarah, is for all of the people who have concerns about this, especially on, on the right, look at the size. This is the Democrats. This is us. There is, I mean, you can't get any clearer in terms of this is government, 
This is not. Um, and I think that part of the reason the visual is important is that when you actually look at the difference, you realize this is what big government does. It crowds out competition. It drives up prices. It stifles entrepreneurship and innovation. Doctors leaving the markets. More and more people not taking Medicaid or TRICARE. That should concern people. When you've got veterans that can't, because most of the time, Medicaid and TRICARE are tied together. So when you have those systems not accepted by doctors, that means the lowest of our the people on the low income scale and people who have served our country have fewer and fewer choices. That alone should be a problem and concerning for many people. But the premium spikes are another problem because, again, even if you're in the exchange, now you're seeing over and over again that happen. You're also seeing young people decide that they'd rather just pay a penalty um, because the cost of those basic programs is out of reach for a lot of young people who are just entering the job market. But again, I, I think the greatest illustration of the differences in the approaches is that size. Our bill, which is a tenth of the size, does repeal and replace in what their bill just did in massive government bureaucracy. And that is a big difference. Jim. Uh, just want to ask you, I mean, you had the uh, Health and Human Services Secretary out here. You just talked about this is the Republican bill, this is the Democrat bill. Is that the President's bill? Is that his health care bill? I, that is a bill that we have worked with with Congress. Uh, we feel very good about where it is. We are looking forward, as I, pre as I mentioned earlier, the President's meeting with the WIP team to encourage them to support it and to build it out. Um, I, I don't think, and I'm not trying to be cute here, but I, I think it's not his bill or their bill. It's a bill that we have worked on with them together. We're very proud of where it stands now. Um, the big difference, Jim, is that unlike before, as I mentioned, when the Democrats jammed it down people's throat and said, waited to get that 60th vote before Senator, with Senator Kennedy still around, um, and then and then basically said, literally, you will have to wait and see what it looks like before we passed it. We not only posted it out there for everybody to look at, but by sending it through regular order, not just putting up for a House vote, but sending it through the committee process, allows Republicans, Democrats, and independents alike to offer up amendments and suggestions, and, and, and the House will work its well. Now, we will continue to give guidance and thoughts and suggestions. But I think the President's core principles are what's going to guide us as we head through the Hill and then over the House and then to the Senate. And just one quick follow-up yeah. on Jonathan Carl's question, because the President made a very serious allegation over the weekend. And, and I think we would all be remiss if we went through this briefing and not try to get you on camera to, to at least offer us some evidence. Where is the evidence, where is the proof that President Obama bugged President Trump? Well, I, I answered this question yesterday on camera on your air. So just yeah. so we're clear, uh, I know this is now will be twice. Uh, but I think I made it clear but, yesterday. I mean, but since yesterday, since yesterday, is nothing there has any changed. New proof? No, is there any new no it's not a question of it's not a question of new proof or less proof or whatever. It's the answer is the same. And I think that which is that I think the, that there is a concern about what happened in the 2016 election. The House and Senate Intelligence Committee have the staff and the capabilities uh, and the processes in place to look at this in a way that's objective, and that's where it should be done. And frankly, if you've seen the response from, especially on the, on the House side, but as well as the Senate, they, well, they welcome this. And so let's let the Senate do their job and the House, excuse me, Intelligence Committees, and then report back to the American people. Yeah. Will the President withdraw the accusation? Does he have any... No, any why would he withdraw it until it's, I mean, in, until it's adjudicated? That's what we're asking. Is for them to look at this and see if there is no is it, them no, about not, raising this accusation. Absolutely not. And I think that what he wants them to do is to look into wiretapping, other surveillance, and, and again, as I mentioned before, the other leaks that are threatening our national security. You're seeing the leaks happen over and over again um, that come out throughout the administration, throughout government, that undermine national security. And I think the appropriate thing to do is to ask the House and the Senate to look into it. Glenn Thrush. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, so it, to, to follow up on the follow-up, um, in terms of uh, you were given an opportunity on air uh, to say whether or not the president still, still supported Director Comey. Does the president uh, support uh, Director Comey? Then a quick follow-up. I have no reason to believe he doesn't. He has not suggested that to be. So now to the non-follow-up to the. Have you seen any evidence yourself? Has the evidence been shared with you or other members, senior members of the president's staff? Uh, as to why he made this particular accusation? Uh, as far as me, no. I'm not in a position that that would be regularly part of my daily duties uh, for the President to sit down and, and go through that. That's at probably a level above my pay grade. But I, as I've mentioned, as I've mentioned, I think the President believes that, uh, that the appropriate place for this to be adjudicated is for the House and Senate Intelligence Committee to have the clearances, the staff, the processes uh, to go through this, look at it, and report back. 
Yeah. Did he, did he, did he share it with? Uh, I'm not going to get it. Look, as as the president made very clear, did he share Glenn. With I, I, I'm not going. As the president said in the statement that he issued on Sunday, we're not going to have further comment on this until this is until this matter is resolved. Sure. Yes. Two, two quick questions. So just to follow up on the follow up. So does the, the White House feel that it's appropriate? You say that you want it to be adjudicated by the uh, congressional committees, right. but the president made declarative statements right. on Twitter. So I, I guess does the, is is the White House position that the president? can make declarative statements about a former president basically committing a crime, and then the, the congressional committees, committee should look into that and basically prove it? I mean, well, I, I no, guess it's not, it's it's not, not a question, no, but I, I take issue with, it's not a question of prove it. Um, I think, as I said now five times to the follow-up to the follow-up, um, that it's not a question of prove it, it's that they have the resources and the clearances and the staff uh, to, to fully and thoroughly and comprehensively investigate this. Uh, and then issue a report as to as to what their findings are. So, but, but President Trump's Twitter statement shouldn't be taken at face value about what. Sure, it should. Of course, it. I mean, why? What, no, I, I. There's nothing, as I mentioned to Jim. It's not that he's walking anything back or regretting. He's just saying that th they have the appropriate venue um, and capabilities to review this. Margaret, I'm sorry. Just on so on the Obamacare replacement. So you've said that it'll, it'll be in phases and that you're going to need additional legislation. So just to clarify, are the the, the cost the cost savings that you guys are projecting right. is that dependent on phase three on the national think, competition plan? Because yeah, well, it's not it's not dependent. Then, I think that in order to see it fully come to fruition, yeah, you have to see all parts of it. But it, the way that it was passed doesn't allow for um, the, the way that it was passed. Uh, is almost the same way that we're we're going through this now, which is they pass certain things. Then the Secretary of Health and Human Services, at the time, ha was granted uh, significant regula regulatory authority that allowed her to do certain things at the time uh, to implement pieces of Obamacare. Uh, that we now have to act backwards and go almost in in the same steps to do what they did to lay it out. We've got to repeal it and then we've got to replace it with the plan that's going to do the same. Certain things can be done in the same way and certain things can't. It just, it literally depends on, on how that was done. John Frederick. Sean, in the replacement plan, it says that the states that accepted the Medicare expansion money would continue to be funded. So what is the <laughs> message you have to Republican <coughs> state legislators that thought they were fiscally responsible in rejecting Medicaid expansion in their states, and now they didn't get they didn't get the federal dollars on either end. What is your well, I think response? What, to yeah, I think what we need to do um, is to make sure, as the president said in in his statements, as Secretary Price did, we've got to make sure that we continue to protect uh, people through this transition process. Let the bill work its way. But this is the first time, as we address the Medicaid portion of, the portion of this, this is probably the first time that we've really addressed an entitlement aspect of something in almost 30 years. Um, so I think we've got to let this piece of it work its way through the House. Uh, but there is, remember, one of the things that happened through the Medicaid expansion was the goal has always been of Medicaid to help people um, who were disabled or poor or met a specific number of criteria. For the first time in Obamacare, we expanded Obamacare, or the Obama administration did rather, to able-bodied individuals that in a way that had never been do done before and it was not a specific class. Uh, that's led largely to the, the ballooning cost. I think a lot of the reforms that will be contained in this bill will address that, but I think we've got to let it work its will through the process. Alexis. Um, I want to ask you two communications questions on two to topics. Because the president gave himself a, a middling grade on communication, let me ask you about the experience that the previous administration had when Obamacare was going through its own phases. <coughs> uh, the president, President Obama, said that, it, that the opposition to the legislation was able to seize the opportunity while it was being legislated to create uh, public perceptions about what was in the legislation. So my question is on ACA, what is the president going to do to improve his communications, to be out there explaining what is in the bill, to work with lawmakers? That's the first question, and then I'll ask you the next one. Okay, thank you. Uh, so on the first one, as I mentioned, uh, he's continuing, he's had and continues to have significant outreach to members of Congress. Um, he's talked to health insurers. I mean, I think 
we've read out a lot of the activities the last couple of weeks, and literally in just within an hour, um, he's going to sit down with the House Deputy Whip team to talk about the legislative piece of this in the House. So this is going to be a very aggressive, um, laser-like focus of this administration over the next you know month or two uh, to get this thing through the House and then moved over to the Senate. Uh, but there's a big difference, Alexis. What we're doing um, is vastly different. Uh, they were expanding government, um, promising people something, and I think what's happened is uh, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of um, difference with how the approach is happening. Right now, the American people, no matter where you are, you understand the the, the state of your health care, the cost that you're seeing, and the lack of choice that you've now been presented with. And in many cases, you realize that when you're going to see the doctor or loved ones going to see a doctor, that they're not getting. A, they're not either able to get in, they're not taking the Medicare or the, the exchange insurance that they got, the costs are going out of control. Um, and, and I think it's really interesting, I mean, one of the things that Dr. Price mentioned that is so apropos of this is having a card does not mean you have insurance. It's like handing someone a blank check. It doesn't mean that you have money, it means you have a check. And I think what we've seen over the last few years with Obamacare is you can have an insurance card, but that doesn't mean someone's going to take it. And it sure doesn't mean that it's going to be affordable. And there's a big difference between having a card and having health care that's affordable. And that's the difference that we're trying to solve right now. And I think so when it comes to communication, I think one of the things that's really helpful is that part of the sell is done for us. The American people understand the state of their health care. They understand how much they're paying for. They've gone to see a doctor or gone to a hospital or had a notice from their carrier saying, we are no longer part of this. Or their employer says, hey, whatever your particular carrier is, I'm not going to, is, is no longer available. We're switching you into this. And so for, for so many Americans, health care is a very, very real part of their, of their daily experience because they're caring for themselves or dealing with an ailment or dealing with children or a loved one or someone else in their family, where they're seeing firsthand the devastation and disaster that Obamacare has caused them in their personal life. So I think there's a welcoming of this effort, and I think it's a lot, it's a lot easier for us to go in, because we don't have to explain the problem. People are living it. And I think for them to understand what we're giving you is more choice, greater competition, we're incentivizing more people to be part of the process, and we're going to be driving down cost those premium. You had a second. My second question on communications has yeah. to do with the, um, with the <coughs> President's uh, assertion about the wiretapping. Yeah. Because the White House wants this now to be handled by the legislative branch and in confidence and classification, can we count on the President to himself while this investigation is going on to cease and desist using Twitter or any other public venue to make accusations that are in public but he will not respond to in public? With respect to this particular situation, I'll, I'll, I'll ask that and I'll, I'll get back to you on that. John Gizzi. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Um, just getting back to the question about if one likes his or her health care, they can keep it. In 2013, uh, Congressman Fred Upton, then chairman of the House Energy Committee, offered legislation that put precisely those words into law and it received the votes of every Republican member in the House and between 40 and 50 Democrats and then it died in the Senate. Would the administration support a revival of the Upton Amendment, in other words putting uh, the right to keep one's health care plan and doctor if he or she liked it today? I mean I think that's the goal. I don't want to start talking about what we're going to as we go through the process, we've now put our stamp on this and sent it to the House. It'll work its will as amendments come up through regular order. Uh, you know, our team will weigh in on those uh, with, with their staff. And again, the President's meeting with the WHIP team today. I don't want to start saying we're going to support this amendment or that amendment now. But I think generally speaking, obviously the goal is to make sure that people get a plan that they like, that's affordable, that meets what they need to have met, that they shouldn't have to have a one-size-fits-all government instilled health care system that doesn't offer any choice or frankly isn't tailored to the needs that they have. I think that's an important thing. Uh, John. Uh, Sean, uh, right now you're two votes short of uh, passing repeal and replace in the Senate because you've got four Republican senators who are saying they can't support the bill because of rolling back the Medicaid expansion. What do you say to those senators who are very concerned that people will lose coverage that this does not provide enough stability for those people who rely on Medicaid for their health care. Well, there, there's two things, John. One is we're at day one. Uh, we've got to get. We're going to go through the House first. 
uh, so we got a little bit of time. And I think as we go through that process, uh, these senators, and not just the, the additional two, but I think and hope that we'll get additional ones that recognize that those people, you know, as I've said over and over again here, it's, it's if we do nothing, they're going to be in a very, very worse scenario than they are now. Um, more and more people, if you're on Medicaid, um, which serves so many low-income Americans, they, as I mentioned, they have a card. And that card does not allow them to go to doctor after doctor or saying we're not going to take Medicaid or TRICARE anymore. So I would ask those senators, what are you doing to help us work on a bill that will get them insured again? Because for too many Americans, they've got a card, but they don't have insurance. And I think that's a very, very big thing, um, to, to a distinction to make. It's, they, they're the ones who have the problem right now. They've got a Medicaid card and nowhere to go. And what we need to do is to make sure that low-income Americans, veterans, small business owners, individuals who desperately need health care have options and affordability. And one, one, other, one other piece of this. You could, you could bring down the cost of the insurance uh, itself through new efficiencies in the system selling across state lines. But the biggest driver of the, the increase in health insurance cost is the skyrocketing cost of medicine. Right. What in this overall plan do you propose to do to either cap the rise or even bring right. it down? Well, I think you, Secretary, mentioned this, but I mean the cost of prescription drugs is That's a one that, small no, reason. it's not. It's a big factor. Right. I think that but when you're when you're paying fifty thousand dollars out of pocket to get a stent, right? I mean, it's, but again, it's what is the biggest of, thing a lot missing? Of people believe but, it's getting out of control. So fair enough. But fair but, enough. But, drugs is one part of it. No, no, but no. no but when, okay, when you talk about procedures or drugs. The biggest thing that's missing in this whole equation is competition. There's no, I mean, we're down to one plan in many places. There's nothing for these places to compete. There's, plenty there's of competition between hospitals. No, no, there's, I mean, that's fine, but if they know they're going to get the same reimbursement rate, if they know that there's no other options, that plans aren't trying to get people, uh, then that's a big difference. Right now, there's a lack of competition um, in the industry. And I think one of the presidents, I get it may be one part of that. But you're right that all over medicine, <laughs> procedures and such, but there's a reason he met with drug executives and talked about getting those costs down, that there's a multifaceted approach and how do we instill competition, how do we drive down costs. But you're right, we've got to do more to get the cost uh, of that down, of the procedures, uh, to allow additional options. Everything that, it's the same way that, again, think about ins your insurance, right? One of the things that was driving up costs in the past was people were exercising the option of going to an emergency room over and over again mm -hmm. for their primary care. And what happened is that you saw all of these, you know, quote unquote clinics pop up from around and, and, and insurance carriers actually made it cheaper in terms of co-pays to go see that than an emergency room driving people to somewhere that didn't continue to drive up costs, clog insurance. Things. That competition alone starts saving the plans money and helping to keep costs down. We've got to instill more aspects of competition in medicine. Jennifer. Can you give us an update on the effort to roll back regulations? Um, have the task force, force uh, regulatory reform task forces identified any regulations to roll back and have any actually been repealed? Um, I, I think that they have had their work cut out for them. They've started. Um, as the president has met with different industries and companies, uh, corporations, associations, that is a constant subject of, of discussion, um, which is those regulatory aspects of our economy that are keeping companies from growing, expanding, and hiring. Um, and so I know that the domestic policy team and others have been working on that. And uh, if, if I can get further updates on specific legislation or, excuse me, specific regulatory action, I'll get back to you, Hallie. Topics for you. Um, and one, just, just trying to get some clarity on something that my colleagues have tried to follow up on as well. You've said that you stand, the president stands by his tweets Saturday morning that President Obama ordered this wiretap. You've also said that the administration wants Congress, that he, and let me just be clear, he said he found out this information. You've also said that the president wants Congress to investigate. Some members of Congress, by the way, have asked the White House and asked the president to come forward with that information. So, bottom line, why would the president want Congress to investigate for information he already has? I think there's a there's a separation of powers aspect here, as I mentioned to Jonathan, uh, that we think it's about resources uh, and time. Why waste that? Well, it's not a question of waste it. It's a question of appropriateness. But if the president has the info, and I guess that's what I'm trying to get to, if he if he's sitting on this information that he found out, he's now directing or asking or recommending that the but, intelligence uh, committees look right. into this. And you talked about they have resources and staff, which they do. Right. But why expend those resources and staff if the president found out this information and hasn't? 
I think there's a difference between directing uh, the Department of Justice, which may be involved in, a, in an ongoing investigation, and asking Congress as a separate body uh, to, to look into something and add credibility to, to the look is adds, uh, adds an element that wouldn't necessarily be there if we were directing the Department of Justice, for example. But again, I think we've made it very clear uh, how he wants this done and where we go from there. So, Second question, then. Um, Millions of Americans are working on their tax returns right now. Will the President commit to releasing his tax returns for this year, and is he still under audit for his past returns? My understanding is he's still under audit, and I'll follow up on the question. Sean, yeah. Sean. Um, question and quick follow up. Uh, how do you uh, react? How do you understand uh, what we've seen on the no growing number of cases at the Canadian border of Canadians born and raised in Canada with valid passport being stopped at the border and told just to go back? They won't let come in in, uh, in the U.S.? I'm not aware of that. Uh, I think that's something that probably should be addressed to the Department of Homeland Security. There might be a misunderstanding of the messages sent by I, the I don't immigration. know, and I think it's a good question that is probably best directed towards the Department of Homeland Security. Dr. Swan. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is the White House going to keep its promise to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement? And our understanding is that there's some divisions of opinion. Rex Tillerson wants to stay in. Steve Bannon wants to get out. What's going on? Will you keep the promise? If not, why not? Yeah, I, I think that's something I, I'd be glad to follow up with, with you and everyone. Uh, I don't have anything on that right now. I'm aware of the discussion of it. So let me, if I can, I'll get back to you. Mike. I had an unrelated question, but I also want to follow up on something that was Unrelated this. questions are my uh, favorite. <laughs> <laughs> had asked, uh, she t talked about the communications strategy. Will the president play a public role in selling this bill? Will he speak to the public about it? Will he answer questions about it? Uh, that's a good question. I think that we are going to have a very comprehensive strategy. As I mentioned, uh, just a few minutes from now, the President is going to engage with, uh, with members of the House uh, whip team uh, to talk to them. I understand that, but, but I know, and I understand that. This is step one, Mike. Uh, there's a lot of time, as I mentioned, we expect to be dealing with this for the next several weeks. Uh, there'll be plenty of opportunities for the President to speak about that, to engage with the public, uh, but it's going to be a comprehensive plan uh, that we will discuss. We had, I can't even begin to tell you how many uh, administration folks, members of Congress, flooding uh, the, the broadcast and radio airwaves today, um, both nationally and in local markets. Uh, we were very, very active um, throughout the country getting out the word on what we're doing and why we're doing it from national uh, broadcast shows to cable to TV, I mean to, uh, to radio. Uh, we had a very, very aggressive uh, start to this effort. Uh, we're working with, with the House in particular. We'll continue to start really engaging with the Senate. But this is going to be a comprehensive effort working with the House and the Senate to get this thing done and other partners, doctors and outside groups that share this concern. As I mentioned earlier, one of the other folks that there is, um, you know, there's a, a need by, by companies and corporations who are feeling the weight of additional costs. To, to join us in this effort, and, um, and I just want to, you know, this is obviously something that, that needs to get dealt with. The, the escalating costs are having a significant impact, not just on our economy, but the, on the ability of people to get hired, or frankly, people who are hired lose their job because the cost of health care is not allowing, especially people in the small and medium-sized businesses, to keep up with those costs. With that, thank you guys very much. I look forward to seeing you. Sean, I had a meeting tomorrow. Congressman Cummings we'll, is meeting with the president. We'll have a readout tomorrow. Well, Sean, I, I, had, I had that unrelated question, which was. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh. I, that's not fair. Mike gets his unrelated question. Will the Trump administration continue the Obama administration's practice of releasing publicly the visitor? We're currently uh, evaluating our. Uh, our procedures in that, and we'll have some when we have an announcement. I'll let you know. In April, I'll have a readout on our schedule for tomorrow. Later, I will have. <laughs> I, 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 once it's confirmed, I will let you know first, and then everybody else. Thank you, guys. Have a great day.